Hi everybody, this is Pastor Ryan here. I wanna welcome you to the live stream tonight. Um, we're in this amazing series on the 12 tribes of Israel and how that relates to the 12 systems of the world that we are called to influence as believers. And tonight you're in for a, um, a real treat because I'm discussing one of the most famous people in the Bible. I'm discussing Joseph and the anointing um, that is upon uh, the tribe of Joseph, as well as his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so I want you to hit that share button right now and help me spread this message around the internet because it's a message that empowers us as believers in our assignment in the world. And uh, we're supposed to be in the world and not of it. And that's the calling of all of the believers. And that's the assignment of the fivefold ministry is to empower the believers for the work of the ministry. We so oftentimes equate ministry to a four walls experience or that if you feel called to ministry, then it must be to stand behind a pulpit. But I believe, especially in this season, God is raising up ministers um, that will make a profound impact in the world um, through their careers, through how they raise their family. And this is uh, the era of the kingdom. And it's not just a catchphrase, but it's really uh, about a culture that you and I are called to um, display to the world. We're supposed to represent Christ. And so uh, there are 12 areas in particular that we could be called to influence. You're talking about um, government. Uh, you could be an influencer in the realm of the environment or the ecological uh, system. You could be called to impact the educational system, the economy, the uh, spiritual system, science, technology, family, medical, defense, the list goes on, but there are 12 of them. And so that's what I've been discussing over the last several weeks. I'm so glad that um, many of you are joining me. Shout out to all of you. Um, please hit that share button. Let's empower some people tonight as we discuss the life of Joseph, one of my favorite um men of God from the Bible. And so let's begin in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for, for this night. I thank you for the spirit of truth that comes to eradicate every lie. And Father, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. I thank you for um, a present continual flow of revelation, Lord, even as I teach and as I read through the scripture, that you would uh, reveal the mysteries of the kingdom to us, Lord, that as I break open your bread, you would nourish us with your life, your truth, Lord. Let the revelation of your word uh, come alive. Let uh, wisdom be applied to our lives, Father. Give us strategy for our everyday living, that we would discover our purpose, that we would um, be able to let go of negative, self-defeating thought patterns that would keep us entangled in old systems and structures, that would keep us bound, um, even in religion, Father. I thank you for the new thing that you are doing in the body of Christ. You are doing such an amazing uh, work, e even uh, that we can't see. Father, we thank you that it's bubbling up even now as I speak, Lord. There's a bubbling up happening in the body of Christ. And, and though has, there has been a shaking, Lord, this is uh, the greatest time for the church that we are able to manifest your kingdom in ways like we never imagined, Lord. And I pray that you would mobilize those industry leaders, Father, to carry your glory into their workplace, to carry their glory into their communities, that the zip codes where we live are blessed because we live here. I wish somebody right now um, watching me would just make that declaration, the zip code. Just go ahead and call out your zip code. The zip code where I live is blessed because I live here. The property values are rising in my zip code. The economy is shifting for the better in my zip code. We declare that health and prosperity is characterized by the citizens who live in my zip code. This land is a prophetic Goshen. I declare that over my city. I declare it over yours. Right now, I declare, Father, that you are raising up um, innovators and uh, transformational leaders from within the 
this zip code, Father. I thank you, Lord, for bringing a, a radical reformation to um, the educational system in our cities, Lord. And I pray tonight as we study about Joseph that you would just encourage us, Father, and give us joy knowing that whatever struggles we in encounter, whatever challenges we endure, uh, whatever battles we face, we are yet victorious and we are confident that all things are working together for us because we love you and we're called according to your purpose, Father. We bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, I want to encourage you if you're watching please hit that share button. I just know God is going to bless you with this word. We're talking about, again, the 12 tribes of Israel, and I've discussed a lot of them. I've discussed Judah, Levi, uh, Naphtali. I've discussed um, so many of them. You can actually go back and listen to all of my previous messages in this series on, on my YouTube channel, uh, Ryan Cole Empowerment. So just search that in your YouTube app and make sure you subscribe and comment and hit the bell for all of the notifications. And then make sure that you make it a habit to blot out at 7 p.m. every Monday night that you're going to join me right here for um, this is what I'm calling Breaking Through the Noise. And the reason I, I titled this program Breaking Through the Noise is because I just felt like many of you this overwhelming onslaught of uh, just information overload and um, opinions coming from all sides, coming from both the world, the media, the church. And a lot of these opinions are rooted in fear. Um, they're just commentating on, you know, their observations about the the things that we're in, going through in the world right now, uh, from the pandemic to the uh, the conflicts socially in our country. You name it. Uh, but I don't want uh, to be another commentator and just discuss what's going on. But instead, I, I've designed this program as a prophetic catalyst that I would empower individuals as strategists that you would bring solutions to some of these challenges that you're uh, seeing in your community, that we together can look at the Word of God because uh, history repeats itself a lot of times. And if, if it's not a, a a carbon copy of an experience that happened in, in biblical times or as recorded in history, surely there are similarities that we can look at. Uh, the Bible says nothing's new that's under the sun. So uh, although we are experiencing a lot of things for the first time, we can be confident that there's someone uh, in the course of history, even in the Bible, who's endured, who's overcome, who's brought strategy to the table. And the Bible is full of strategies. It's not just a historical um it's a historical uh, con uh, construct. It's not just a, a document for us to read about uh, as a story. But even as we go into the, the history of Joseph tonight, I want us to begin to extract principles that we could apply to the situations going on nationally, but even more so locally. And that's um, my goal with breaking through the noise that we cut through the, the chaos, the confusion, because God is not the author of confusion. He is a God of order. And for every challenge, he's already placed a solution on the inside of somebody. For every generation, he raises up leaders. He raises up uh, in every family deliverers. And we see that time and time again. There are chosen ones. And this was really Joseph. Joseph was a, a chosen one in his family. And although he was the 11th born of Jacob, who we also know as Israel, um, he received the birthright of being a firstborn son, which was very unprecedented uh, in uh, Jewish history. And as we look throughout um, Hebrew culture, it's, it's always the firstborn son that gets the birthright blessing and the inheritance. And then it trickles on down to the other siblings as well. But we see this upended several times um, because God uh, is able to to shift things to accommodate those who he anoints and those who are also obedient to his voice. 
And that's what uh, Joseph was. He was set apart. He was born of uh, Rachel, who was really the love of Jacob's life. And so he he was born kind of in privilege, uh, unlike the rest of his brothers who had um, different stigmas attached to the, them. The stigmas uh, that Joseph had to fight against weren't passed on by his parents necessarily, but he was just a bull's eye because he was so favored. Um, Joseph's story is one of the most um, cataloged stories out of all of the people in, in, that we read about in the Bible. Some people, um, especially a lot of these tribes, are mentioned very briefly, but we get from Genesis chapter 37 on through Genesis chapter 50, this really detailed account of the journey of a man from really the age of six years old to about uh, until he died when he was 110. And so we see um, at six years old, uh, Joseph was moved with his family into uh, a new land, and uh, Jacob was raising his son there. And of course, uh, J Joseph became known as the beloved son. This was who he was. He was born in a Mesopotamian town um, to Jacob and to Rachel, but he left that town and journeyed to the land of Canaan. And this was really a promised land of, of, of the children of Israel. And he settled in Hebron um, inside of Canaan. Jacob had this ex extra type of affection that he gave to Joseph. Joseph was um, born to a mother who had been called barren. And we see this a lot of times. Uh, this was really the third generation of barren women who had promised children. We see it with um, Sarah who um, was barren until she was way up in her, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, and God gave her a promise and fulfilled that promise in providing Isaac. And then we saw that Isaac was married to Rebecca, who was also barren, and that she um, finally uh, was given uh, this pro promise. And uh, we see that um, Jacob and Esau were born. And then we see it happen again. Uh, Rachel was really um, the love affair of Jacob's life, and yet she was barren. And he had other wives who had conceived and had children, and really there was this rivalry going on. So when Rachel had a child, and in um, Jacob's older age, this was a big deal. And Jacob give, gave this affection over to Joseph that he really didn't give to any of his other sons. And um, of course, this prompted jealousy among all of the brethren. And if you've ever read the story or watched any kind of uh, cinematic depiction of this, you see the treatment of Joseph because of the favor that was upon his life. His parents made him a coat of many colors. And it just represented this um, sort of royalty that he carried, um, the favor that he had, which was, again, um, something that wasn't a part of normal culture to be such a child on, lower down on the totem pole to be given such favor. And um, Joseph began to have dreams. He was a dreamer. And this is indicative of those who are anointed. Um, with the anointing of Joseph, uh, is that you're a dreamer and that oftentimes your dreams are misunderstood. Even you misunderstand your own dreams. Um, and Joseph began to share his dream. And that's when a lot of the tension came to a head. And he was around 17 years old when this happened. And so uh, Joseph had two specific dreams that uh, really rattled his brother's uh, the first dream was he saw these sheaves of wheat um, that were bowing down to this larger kind of uh, sheave of wheat, if you were to call it. And they were bowing down and 
Um, and so that angered his brothers. And then um, also he had a second dream where he saw, you know, all of these stars in the sky and uh, his star shone the brightest. Um, and this, even the sun and the moon, which represented his mother and father, kind of revolved around him. And uh, they viewed this, his brothers did, as sort of arrogant and prideful and who do you think you are? And, uh, you know, just really pushed him as an outcast and just criticized him for his favor. And yet he uh, continued uh, to, you know, push into these dreams and knew that there was something that was uh, being revealed to him through these dreams. And what's so interesting, as we see his uh, brothers uh, sell him into slavery and he goes through um, these various trials before he ends up in the palace in Egypt, um, is that so many times when we look at dreams and when other people have dreams as well, our misunderstanding of those dreams can really put us in a position where we'll either have offense or where we'll um, we'll, we'll try to sabotage whatever it is that we see and not really understanding uh, the implications of a dream. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that Joseph dreamed that they all were going to become stars, that they all would ascend into um, royalty, really, and favor. And each one of them would land among the stars in the sky. And it just so happened that, that his shone the brightest, but it didn't take away from the fact that they all were shining stars. And yet they couldn't see that because of their hatred towards their brother. They couldn't see that if God blessed him, that they all would be elevated. And I'm not sure how the story would have gone otherwise. You know, obviously him being sold into slavery benefited him in the long run. And that's a little odd to say, but God used what the enemy meant for evil and directly positioned him to gain these skills, uh, to uh, acquire favor and first the house of Potiphar and then endure um, sexual allegations that were unfounded. And we see that as he was um, thrown into jail for these allegations of sexual uh, misconduct or really raping uh, Potiphar's wife, we see him again have favor with his cellmates. And so that tells us that favor doesn't require the circumstances in order to work. It doesn't require, favor doesn't require um, favorable circumstances in order for favor to work. In fact, favor thrives even more so in hostile environments. And this is really those with the anointing of Joseph. And it's it's kind of um, this, this paradox of the blessing. So many people want to be blessed, but they don't understand that with the blessing comes the pressure, comes the crushing, comes the persecution. Everybody wants to be anointed, but they don't understand what it's going to require of them, the discipline that it's going to take, how much you're going to have to say no, how you're going to have to be disciplined in your, your spirit and in your body. They don't understand that. We just want the beautiful side of the story. We want what comes at the end end of the rainbow. Um, we want uh, to, to see ourselves sitting at the top of the food chain or sitting in the palace, but we don't want the process to get us there. Um, and really, I, I think that if God were to, to tell us the trials that we were in, in would endure, we wouldn't ever sign up for it. But of course, we aren't really given that insight. Even Joseph, who was a dreamer, had no idea that in order for that dream to come to pass, that he would have to endure um, slavery, that he would have to endure mistreatment, alleg false allegations, that he would be thrown into prison, that he would be um, eat up and sped out, that he would be betrayed by those who were his brothers. Can you imagine what he felt in those moments? And yet God had a plan for his life. And I want to encourage you out there that um, favor thrives in the midst of adversity. We saw that 
uh, upon the life of Joseph. No matter what harsh circumstances he found himself in, the favor of God made a way for him. And I'm telling you that the favor of God is making a way for you. You may not understand it with the circumstances that are happening in your life right now, but I'm promising you that the favor of the of God is making a way. God is a way maker. He, he, he blazes new trails. If there's not a path already laid out, he will be there to make Make it for you. I'm telling you, every crooked place is being made straight. Every, every mountain is being brought low. Every valley is being lifted up. And I'm declaring to you that you are moving forward in this season on an even playing field towards purpose and destiny. I know there's a lot going on in the world right now, but if you could only see, just like Joseph, in the midst of our adversity as a church, in the midst of being suppressed as a church, in the midst of, of one of our, our, our most challenging times in history, if you could see favor working for you, then you would give God a praise right in the middle of it, that you would give God a praise in the midst of your storm, knowing that he's going to cause the winds that are blowing uh, um, and stirring things up right now to move in your favor and push you into your greatest level of purpose. In fact, I'm not even sure that if Joseph had not endured the trials, if he would have ever landed in the palace in Egypt, if he would have ever been able to save his brothers, um, they didn't understand that it was working for them. And this is too what I want to bring uh, to the table. Uh, when his brothers plotted against Joseph and they threw him into the pit and left him there for dead, um, there was compassion that rose up in, in one or more of the brothers and they decided, let's not kill him, let's sell him into slavery. The Bible said that it was an Ishmaelite that came by and bought Joseph. And I want you to hear that again, an Ishmaelite. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, that name Ishmael stands out really, really profoundly. When we look uh, just a couple of generations before, we see that there was this uh, uh, other conflict between brothers. You had Ishmael that was born to a handmaiden, um, to, Ab to Abraham, who out of impatience, Abraham and Sarah decided to try to force the hand of God. And Sarah gave her handmaiden to Abraham and she continued conceived a son named Ishmael, and um, yet he was not the promised child that God had spoken of that would eventually be born and be named Isaac. And we know out of Isaac, the, uh, the, the 12 tribes of Israel came through Jacob. Um, but what was so significant is what was a mistake in a former generation, God even turned around for his good. Ishmael, which was really a mistake of Abraham to rush the hand of God, to push the hand of God, to step out of obedience and patience and waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. And so he had this other son. The descendants of this child ended up uh, working into the equation, and it was Ishmael who bought Joseph into slavery and then sold him to Potiphar. So I'm telling you, no matter what, the, even the mistakes of your parents, even generational curses, God will turn it around. Every curse is being reversed, and it's beginning to work in your favor. God is causing the trials that you have endured to push you into the fulfillment of your purpose. And I'm I'm telling you. If you could see it the way that I see it, if you could see um, the the United States and all that we're enduring right now the way that I see it, you would be encouraged to know that those who are a part of the family of God, um, especially those who carry this anointing of Joseph, are going to rise in prominence and, and favor um, like we've never seen before throughout the, the course of history. Um, this is an amazing time to be alive. Joseph was a chosen one, and he wasn't just chosen, and he wasn't just given this favor to, um, to, to really build his own wealth here in the earth. He wasn't given this favor for just his own sake, but God saw the future. God saw um, the famine 
God saw Egypt enduring um, seven years of plenty and seven years of famine, and he knew that there would not be a political and a um, economic strategist in the land of Egypt. And so knowing this broad plan, God raised up Joseph for this period of time. And, and, and the blessings and the favor that was upon his life wasn't even about him. It was about saving uh, nations. It was about impacting nations. Not only did Joseph uh, save Egypt, but he saved uh, uh, the nation of Israel as well. He saved all of his brothers and fo the foreign lands that came in to buy of the stored up grain because of the wisdom that Joseph had. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, it's so fascinating. When Joseph was in prison, we see that there was a cup bearer. Um, there was a baker that were imprisoned with him and they had dreams. And not only was uh, Joseph a dreamer, but he was a dream interpreter and he was such a skilled man. He, um, he learned from a young age, um, all of these, uh, high level principles from mathematics to agriculture to, uh, you name it languages when he came into Egypt and even having that time in Potiphar's house, being able to grow even more in his education, even as a slave, he found himself being educated and it was all in preparation for uh, his assignment and we see that um, it was a dream that uh, Pharaoh had of these you know seven stalks of grain and or yeah and then the seven uh, cows that were famished and were eaten up by these other seven and so we uh, we see uh, just the the famine eating, the, the good years, but this was like this agricultural strategy that Pharaoh had no idea he would need, but Joseph was there. He was there to offer insight. And so even if, as we look at the life of Joseph, we see uh, a lot of parallels in the systems of the world, right? So if you have the anointing of Joseph, you're more than likely going to be very analytical. You're going to be good with math and numbers and science. You're going to be very technologically driven. Those who have the anointing of Joseph are going to find themselves in government. And you wouldn't necessarily be a number one, but you would be a chief political strategist, or you would be a part of the cabinet of either a local government or a national government. You would find yourself in the environmental system. Now, the environment and the ecological system is an, an entire uh, system in and of itself that's not mentioned uh, necessarily in the Seven Mountains prophecy that lists off media and government and all of those. Um, so it's important that we look at all 12 because the environment in and of itself is a system filled with multiple industries. And most people, when you say the word environment nowadays, you're thinking about global warming and those sort of uh, political um, kind of talking points. But it's not just about global warming. Of course, it, it spans a larger spectrum. So those with the anointing of Joseph would have a, um, a strategy for for food planning, for nation building, for, uh, for laying out long long-term plans, uh, you would be uh, well advised to go into career paths that would lead you into city planning. Um, I live in a beautiful city, the sing city of Greenville, South Carolina. And if you just Google it, you can see um, this amazing uh, landscape and this uh, beautiful downtown. But less than really 20 years ago, that downtown as we know it didn't even exist. But it took the, the vision and the foresight of some great city planners. Um, not to say everything's perfect. Uh, I do love my city, that's for sure. But one thing things for certain. If you just take a snapshot of our downtown, you realize how powerful vision is and city planning and uh, just seeing all of uh, the economies that have and industries that have boomed because of that. Um, it's just astounding. So if you have the anointing of Joseph, you would see uh, yourself in the development of roadways and the development of new technologies. So let's go over this again. You, you would be in the system of, of the 
the government, right? So you would also be in the environmental system or the ecological system. And so you're really focusing on the environment. Um, you're focusing on a food and agriculture. Um, you would also find yourself in the economy because we know that the government and the environmental system has inherent um effects on the economy. So you would find yourself in the business world in that regard. Um, you would also find yourself in the scientific system and the technological system. Uh, th this would be, um, you know, developing new ways of storing um, food or distributing food or, you know, developing new ways of farming in general or any kind of technology, really. But if we look at the story of Joseph, it's obviously agriculture because he he was known in, to be in the vineyards and he was known to be in the fields and he developed this storage system to keep the, the grain fresh and then he was also just a master economist to be able to distribute that grain not only to those who lived in Egypt but those who came from abroad where this famine affected and that's really how he came back into contact with his brothers. Um, his brothers came from Canaan. They were experiencing a famine and they had this um this reunion with their brother but they didn't recognize him of course and and that's how it goes most of the time lord when the lord elevates you pe people don't don't always recognize you for for what what you have ascended to but you know joseph didn't necessarily need the recognition he just needed the assurance that his brothers had developed a stronger set of values uh, and principles um and so we see this testing going on and you know joseph was in the shadows for a bit and he tested his brothers and um and then of course uh, we see this uh, reconciliation happen between Joseph and his brothers and his younger brother um uh, born by the same mother and father by the name of Benjamin who is very much like Joseph in in a lot of ways uh his mother had passed but his father got to see his son again the chosen one this reunion happened and it was so powerful because what 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 set it up uh in Egypt was this um was this uh, amazing favorable position and really Jacob uh when he died was mourned by Israel for 70 days and there was this national uh pride uh, over this family um, and so they had great favor in this land because of Joseph and how much of a strategist he was. Joseph was favored. He endured trials, but he also um, he he also uh, was favored to, with God and elevated him. We're going to get back in the flow here in just a second. But we're talking about Joseph and really what's unique again about this tribe is that when Jacob died, and this is what we've been talking about, before he died, he called all of his sons around uh, to pronounce a blessing over their lives. And what's unique about Joseph was that he was given the birthright of a firstborn son, even though he was 11th in, in the line of 12 children. Reuben did not receive the firstborn blessing who should have. Uh, Jacob gave it to Joseph. Not only that, Joseph was the only son who was able to bring his sons into the camp, into the tent where Jacob was releasing this blessing. He had two sons while he was living in the land of Egypt, even before he was reunited with his father and his brothers. He had two sons, one by the name of Ephraim and the other by the name of Manasseh. And these two um, uh, boys would accompany their father into this tent. And the amazing thing happened in as much as God uh, asserted this protocol within Jewish culture and Hebrew culture of the time to pass on a birthright or an inheritance to the firstborn son. He did it again with Joseph's sons. We see the older of the two uh, did not receive the blessing that Jacob was passing on through Joseph. 
but it was the younger one who received this blessing. It was, um, it, it was Ephraim who received what should have been a Manasseh's. Ephraim was the younger, but he received the blessing. And we even see Joseph kind of confounded by this and tried to move his father's hand. But, uh, but Jacob crossed over his hand to anoint with his right hand of favor upon Ephraim. And that just lets me know that no matter what system you feel locked in, no matter the amount of privilege you feel like you have or that you're born into, whether that's economic privilege or social privilege or what whatever um, struggles you feel like are surrounding your life, know that God will upend structures of protocol in order to release his favor to you as long as you're obedient. And we see um, this favor rest upon Joseph and his two sons in so much that Manasseh and Ephraim became uh, tribal leaders, uh, almost to the status of the rest of Jacob's sons, and they did this in their father's uh, in their father's name, Joseph. But they had two tribes with two allotments of land, and we see them carry this um, immense amount of favor. But with this comes in the story this uh, preface of a warning to all of us, those who have an anointing of God, who have a calling upon their life, who sit uh, and settle in that seat of favor and become complacent in their calling is that we in one generation can lose the favor of God in, in as quickly as we have gained it. And let me explain, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, they, they were um, favored by God, yet they settled and were complacent in their obedience to the voice of God. They were the grandsons of Jacob, but they've been elevated into the place of sonship. Um, and really, it speaks to just the level of, uh, you know, succession protocols that we need to enact. Like, what was it that Joseph failed to do? What, what, why didn't he instill some of the same values in his sons that he himself had? Was it the pressure of the job? What was it? Because we see um, on through uh, the history, uh, as, as we look in the book of Joshua, um, just this rebellion come from the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. They be, were idol worshipers. They rebelled against God. They became known as half tribes. And part of, of that was because they were halfway obedient and uh, they were prideful in that obedience and even approaching Joshua, who was their brethren. Joshua was born from the tribe of, of Ephraim. And yet uh, Joshua recognized even in his own generation, those who have become lazy and complacent in their anointing. And uh, they came complaining to Joshua about their allotment of land and the work that they had to do and what, and they wanted more. And Joshua turned around and told them, listen, you have every thing that you need to succeed. Joshua turned around and told them, you are sons born of Joseph, and yet you are complaining about the favor that is upon your life, and yet you're not working it. And if you want more, this is exactly what Joshua said. If you want more, you can have more but you've got to put in the work. You've got to be obedient to the voice of God. And that's really what distinguishes people. Even though you may be anointed, the moment you stop being obedient to the voice of God is the moment that you disconnect yourself from that favor that was given to you. And even that which we pass down to our children, we also need to make sure that we're passing down not just the anointing and the blessings, but that we're passing down the values and the character and the integrity that um, our sons need to be able to to thrive and to uh, live in that anointing and capitalize on that anointing. We see Joseph was uh, such an incredibly gifted man, well-educated. He had the favor of God. But even in that, what was really his secret sauce was that he was obedient and that he had integrity and character. 
unlike uh, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, who really had it fairly easy in comparison to their forefather, Joseph, you know, Joseph endured and had all the excuses in the world to want to lay aside his values, his character and his ethic ethics in order to sin and to, you know, give in to his temptations. Even in the midst of being in Potiphar's house, when um, he was tempted by Potiphar's wife to engage in this relationship with her, you know, it, it was just amazing his level of integrity that he said no when he had all the excuses in the world to say yes. And so I want to encourage you even as um, you're thinking about what God has called you to do, you are anointed. That's the plain and simple truth. You have an anointing from God. And, and guess what? As long as you're sitting on your hands, you will never be able to access the fullness of your potential. And so I implore you, don't be like Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, who ended up forfeiting uh, that favor that was upon their life, but be obedient and hearken to the voice of God. Be diligent to what he is instructing you to do. You have all the anointing that you need. You have all the favor that you need. You have all the gifting that you need. It's at your disposal. You have everything that you need to succeed, but yet you're sitting on your gifts. And so I want to challenge you tonight to think about that. Everything. Think about, think about the anointing that is upon your life and how precious that is and how easily we can take for granted the presence of God and sit. You know, God feels a certain way about people who are slothful and sit on their hands when he has favored them and anointed them. Look at even the parable of the talents of the man who who hid his talent and didn't occupy that place of power that was given to him. And he looked down on what was given to him. And, and we can look at the circumstances right now going on in the world and we can say, you know, uh, we have every excuse to sit around and be lazy and sit back and let the world pass us by. Or we could say to ourselves, no, the fact that the world is swirling on around us is an indicator that we have something to offer, that the anointing on our life is real. You know, the book of Romans says that the earth is groaning in birthing pains, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's not that you're not anointed. It's that you've been sitting too long and you don't need permission to succeed. You don't need permission to obey God. You don't need man's approval. You don't need, uh, you don't need uh, validation or affirmation. You've had enough prophetic words that I'm telling you tonight with the anointing of Joseph, you will prevail. You will succeed. You will overcome the odds. You will defeat uh, the, the, the giants in the land. You have something to offer. You can go into your career and say, I'm anointed in government. I'm anointed in agriculture. I'm anointed in technology in science. I'm anointed to make a difference in my community. Just like Joseph brought solutions to the table, God has given you everything that you need to bring those strategies to our government. What the world needs now is leadership. Will you arise into your place of power and potential? Don't be like Ephraim and Manasseh who sabotaged the favor upon their life. In fact, we see that in the account of Revelations, the book of Revelations that lists the 12 tribes of Israel, the, the names of Ephraim and Manasseh are removed because they set on the favor of God and instead Joseph's name is listed. Let me go back to the, the last person who had integrity, the last person who was obedient, the last person who heeded my command and made an impact on the world. You know, being passed over is of our own choosing. How much are you willing to give? I know deep down, you know, that you carry an anointing. I know deep down that 
that there's more to life than what you've been living and you feel it burning on the inside of you. And guess what? There is, it's called the kingdom. And God is awakening you to this reality that he has a culture that he wants you to release when you go to your job in your home with your children and your your family, in your community. He wants you to be a carrier of his glory and you know it too. But the enemy will convince us that the circumstances that we're encountering are an indicator that uh, that things are are not going to go like we anticipated. But but unbeknownst to uh, uh, to the enemy, what he means for evil, God will turn around for our good. That's what Joseph said when he was re- reconciled with his brothers. What you meant for evil. God used it for my good and not only my good, our good, because in this elevation process, Joseph saved the entire nation of Egypt. He saved nations surrounding him. He saved the lives of his family members and and he was mightily used by God. Listen, God wants to use you to, to shape the nations, to, to uh, bring transformation to our government. In, in this time when we need it so badly, uh, would you arise? Will you arise and, and discipline yourself and do what it takes to step into the fullness of your anointing? This is the anointing of Joseph, of the tribe of Joseph and his two sons. Just to kind of give you some fun facts about this tribe, Joseph's name meant he will increase. And of course, we saw that occur throughout his life that no matter the circumstances, right, the favor of God prevailed. His son Manasseh, his name meant one who forgets. And this meaning God made Joseph to forget all of his hardships. This was listed in Genesis chapter 41. Ephraim, his name meant double fruitfulness. God made Joseph fruitful in the land of his suffering. The stone that is uh, upon the breastplate of the high priest that represented these tribes were um, this yellow brown stone from Manasseh, Agate. Agate. And for Ephraim, it was Jacinth. It was this orangish red stone. And also we see uh, the icon of this of these two tribes as being the ox. And the ox is the king of the domesticated animals. And so God elevated them in a more refined society, which was Egypt. God elevated them through education. God elevated them through industry. And he allowed the the favor to go before them. And this was the ox. The lion is the king of the jungle or the wild animals, but the ox was the king of the domesticated animals. Uh, This was the anointing of Joseph. And uh, my prayer is that if this resonated with you, that you would really look at your life right now and see um, if you're doing everything that God has commissioned you to do, if you're being obedient to the voice of God. Because in one generation, I'm, I'm painfully aware of it. And it's painful to read the story of how Ephraim and Manasseh's life unfolded. But I'm aware that even our faith can expire in one generation, that uh, a move of God that we experience in one lifetime can fade away in the next. If we do not instill these values in the next generation, and if we don't heed to the voice of God and s- stay obedient to his promptings, I, my fear is as the American church, sometimes we have it too good. Um, and we have it too easy and we become complacent in our services and in our our kind of nine to five experience, this monotonous going to church out of ritual. And we have lost sight of what it means to be led by the voice of the Holy Spirit, as we've seen in generations past. But I'm choosing for my generation to be one who will listen to the voice of God and obey his promptings. This is the anointing of Joseph, one who will maintain values and integrity when he has all the excuses in the world not to. And so I I speak a blessing over you tonight. My goal is that with this series, you're able to pair kind of which tribes that you feel 
most similar to, and that will give you direction as to your calling, your career path, your purpose. And um, I, I pray that that you are blessed by this and that you'll continue to support this program, Breaking Through the Noise, by uh, sharing and visiting me back every Monday night at 7 p.m. And I'm praying for you. Send me your prayer request. We're praying every Monday night at 8.30, and we will pray for you. So please send us what you need prayer for, and we got you. We got you covered. Uh, I'm excited to share this uh, message with you guys. Um, it, it's truly impacting a lot of people who have reached out to me and let me know that they are becoming even more aware of their purpose and, and the unfolding of the plan of God in their lives. Um, not just for their lifetime, but how their life plays into God's eternal plan. When I first study, started studying about prayer, um, it became very evident very quickly where we have gone off course in, in terms of our prayer lives. When God said, if all of your prayers were answered today, would it change the world or just yours? What he was saying to me was, you know, do your prayers focus in and uh, in on you, you know, does your career choices, does your daily decisions focus in on you? Are you myopic in how you approach your relationship with God? Is it all about you? Even is it just all about your family? But what if you understood that you have a part to play in this eternal unfolding of the plan of God that stretches far beyond your lifetime to generations yet unborn to time. If you only knew that, then how would you pray? Then how would you respond to the voice of God? How would you even uh, approach marriage and who you partner with to fulfill your purpose? I'm excited also about uh, the podcast that my wife and I have called Needed Conversations. You've got to make this a, a, a weekly part of your listening uh, a repertoire that you subscribe on podcasts, Spotify, Apple, all of that, and that you follow us right now. We're in the summer of love. We're talking about marriage, dating, relationships, these needed conversations. And uh, this week we're talking about the role of a wife and we're breaking down that uh, word wife in the uh, original uh, Hebrew uh, origins of the word and what it means to be a godly wife. And the next week, we're going to do the same for the husbands. But we're discussing gender roles in society. We're addressing some of the elephants in the room. So you want to go subscribe to it. And what this is leading up to is on July 22nd and 23rd, coming up in a few weeks, we're going to do a two-night webinar for all those who are single, wanting to be married. Maybe you're already dating or you're even engaged. We're going to give you principles from the Word of God so that you can discover lasting love. You're going to want to join us on the 22nd and 23rd. I'm going to release details at the end of this week as to how you can register for this free webinar, and it's going to be profoundly impactful. So you want to get all of these tools that I believe God has downloaded into my wife and I for our generation, a revelation that I, uh, has never really been taught before about marriage. You know, most people go to the scriptures in the New Testament when they talk about marriage and it's easy to go to those. But my, in talking with God, I said, God, there's got to be more in the Bible about marriage. And he said to me, son, the entire book is about marriage. And it's about a, a love story between a groom and his bride. We're the bride of Christ, the church. So if you take it from that perspective, what is the scripture saying? Every scripture about marriage, because I believe marriage is the most powerful institution that God created. Upon this institution, he used those same blueprints to build his church. We're the bride of Christ again. And so my wife and I are going to be talking about all these principles to give you a jumpstart on marriage so that you can truly experience lasting love. Marriage is meant to last. And if you knew how many other aspects of our world are impacted by marriage and an emphasis on marriage within our communities, then you would take it more seriously as well. So I want you to get ready at the end of this week. We're going to be releasing those details for you to register on the 22nd and 23rd of July. We'll be having this two-night webinar. So uh, be in tune for that. Subscribe to our podcast and meet me back here every Monday at night at 7 p.m. for Breaking Through the Noise. God bless you.